Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to come and talk today. And also, thank you for giving up your own time. Because I think what's always important when we talk as coaches, uh, we talk about developing other people, but the real key to coaches is developing their own ability and their own experience and their own knowledge. Because if you help one coach, you can help upwards of 100, 200 volunteers, horses and, and people. So for you to give up your own time today to develop your own experience and knowledge, thank you very much for, for giving me your time. And I hope at the end of it, you'll be able to take away two or three key things that you'll be able to put back into your own coaching, whether it's uh, coaching for disability or, or anybody else. Um, this presentation is a little bit odd. And they sort of say that um, perfect planning prevents poor performance. And I think the fact we planned this presentation to come after the one about LTAD before is good sign that the system is working. However, this presentation has taken about 15 years to evolve. So I must be quite a slow developing coach. It's also um, a very private and personal case study. And in a way, unfortunately for all of you, it's a bit of an autobiography. So I'm afraid you'll have to just put up with that. And so we talked earlier about LTAD and LTED. This is probably LTCD, or long-term coaching development. But it's still my pathway. It is not a blueprint for success. It's just something that I've evolved and I've created that suits my way of thinking, which probably at the end of it tells you a little bit too much about the way I think. Um, in 2009, my mentor and coach was clearing out a cupboard. And in it, she found, this was in England, she found a pamphlet by the Canadian Para Skiing Organisation. And it was the first time I'd heard of LTAD. Now, I know it's evolved into a 10-phase program now, but actually they started off with five phases. And I found this 10 years ago, suddenly realised it was what I was doing, as Cara would say, in isolation. And I basically put it together because what I've done in life is unique in that the young lady up there is called Sophie Christensen. She's now 30 years of age. I first met her 18 years ago. And at the time, she was a therapeutic rider on the lead rein with two side helpers. Now, I had no idea what she had, although now in para dressage, I am now known as Simon Cowell, for those of you that know about Got Talent and that sort of thing. And she had something. She had a difficult, determined, driven mind. She's now got a master's degree in pure mathematics and she works three days a week for Goldman Sachs in London, as well as being eight times Paralympic champion. And what we did was we created this 15-year this 15-year long-term athlete, well, very long-term athlete development plan. Um, and this is just the story of it, really. If the, um, hopefully, the language, I was rewriting my presentation in the last um, presentation, hopefully the language starts to uh, click in with, with, the, with what we were talking about earlier. I would also say I am not a natural horse person. I didn't start riding until I was 16 years of age. And I, did, and I only started because the football, the soccer team, sorry, I'm in Canada, the soccer team I supported were relegated to the second division. And so instead of watching a second division soccer match, I, being me, learned to ride a horse instead. Um, I also did it the old-fashioned way. I rode once a week, and when I, when I earned a paper round, I could afford to ride twice a week. And then I went to a little bit more money. I rode three times a week. And when I left school, that was it, working with horses. And I was a barn rat. Slightly older one, but I was a barn rat. And my background isn't in para. I originally did horse trials. I've driven horses, bit of vaulting, bit of racing. Not anymore. Um, I also fell off horses a lot as a stunt rider. 
Um, that is also a long time ago. And then suddenly I was in Holland and somebody shouted, loose horse. And I turned around and it ran over me. And it left me unconscious for about 20 minutes. And it left me with epilepsy. And it left me with that whole post-traumatic thing where your temperament changes. 30 years on, I've got control of my new temperament. It's taken a long time. And while I was struggling, and I did the whole alcohol, drugs, attempted suicide thing, as you do, and somebody said I should work with disabled athletes, or participants, or whatever, clients. And I went, forget it. They're in wheelchairs. There's no way I can do that. And my mentor said, OK. Come and teach a lesson for me next week. And I taught this lady, and she was had a bit of a funny position. Um, she was already on the horse when I started. And when she got off, she got off into a wheelchair. And she was she actually later became world champion. Um, and everybody said, There you go, you can teach disabled people because it's parallel. And this was before para became a, a recognized name. And of course, para does stand for parallel not for paraplegic. So this is, as I say, my presentation, and that just gives you a bit of a background, because I then w I went to work at a centre for... They told me I could work there for six months. I left 20 years, 11 months and 13 days later. And it was there where I met Sophie as a 13-year-old. So, just like we were talking about earlier, the first stage is obviously fundamentals. And I'm not going to go into all the language and everything else because we've covered that in the previous presentation. You can see here we have a young lady on a very safe pony. Patch at the time was 30. Perfectly safe for doing his job. He didn't mind side helpers. You'll notice that you'll see a common theme throughout the videos and the pictures. I'm a little bit allergic to stirrups. Now, I know in a health and safety conscious world, that's a little bit controversial, but I've not really ever shied away from controversy. I believe that without stirrups, athletes fall off better. They don't get stuck. Also, if you have a young child with a disability who suddenly starts crying or doesn't like it, it's a lot easier to be able to remove them from the pony safely, quicker, without stirrups. Uh, and Thirdly, when you have riders who have an impaired feel, even though we think they look straight on a horse, very often they will feel unbalanced if they're neurologically impaired. Take away the stirrups, and on the whole, they sit a lot straighter. So for me, part of the fundamentals is actually sitting correctly on a horse, as well as the confidence. And you can see this young lady is, look, no hands, mum. I might be a bit concerned that the leader at the front is looking at the rider rather than where they're going, but that's um, the way it goes. So this, this is, these are just my notes for what I'm looking for in phase one of fundamentals. So obviously the outcome for me is to start any rider on their journey. So there's fun, enjoyment, safety, and of course, physical therapy. However, I am not a therapist. Heaven forbid anyone that was had th therapy from me. The note underneath it is talking about classification because when we're talking about para sport, obviously at this stage, being the first stage, classification is not needed. We just, I believe, need a letter from a medical professional to state that riding is a safe thing to do. I will warn you that the medics don't always get it right. I was teaching a little boy one day. His form said he was tetraplegic. Three limbs affected. Never ridden a horse before. Put him on the pony. Trying to find something positive to say. And I went, wow, this leg looks fantastic. Let me just put it in the right position. And as I moved his leg, I heard this. And his leg swung in the breeze. And I looked at him. And he wasn't crying, and the leg was swinging in the breeze, and he's still not crying. And so I poked his leg, and this was the noise I heard. 
and no one had told me he was tetraplegic, but his fourth limb was artificial. So the leg I moved was plastic, and the reason why it was swinging in the breeze was because it had come off, the, off his real leg. But nobody had told me. Or the situation I had where I took a young rider to look in the mirror. He looked in the mirror, absolutely fine. Then his mother said to me, you do realise he's visually impaired, don't you? So you have to make sure that the medics give you the right information. But it is important that we have a medical form, I think. So, as I say, it's therapist-led. They don't make mistakes about visual impairment and artificial limbs. So the bit underneath about Cantra, obviously that's a Canadian therapeutic programme. In Britain, we call it Riding for the Disabled. And obviously PATH is North American. And it tends to be, at this stage, we would tend to be in a therapy centre and supported by the therapy centre. So, I still believe at this stage the coach should support the session. But the, coach, the coach's part at this point is more equine welfare, weight of the athlete, making sure the pony is trained to stand still making the pony as rhythmical in its walk. Because you can't, and sure, you shouldn't ever put disabled children on disabled ponies. And lameness always in a pony means pain. And because of our therapy, our therapists are very well trained at therapy, and they may not be, may, they may not be the best at the, with the horse side of things. So my job is to make sure the venue is safe, the horses are trained, and as we saw from the previous picture, the volunteers are trained. What I'm really looking for at this stage is a safe and confined area. I know I've just shown you a photograph of a child riding in the woods, but I do prefer indoor schools. There's walls around them to, to catch people and lose ponies and things. So I also think indoor schools, um, the distractions are less. For a child with ADHD, learning problems, they're actually in the zone for half an hour. Um, also might like to use a mechanical horse when we're looking at transitions between walk and halt, walk and trot maybe. Getting the athlete or the, the participant to start to feel the way a horse moves. And they can do that in a safe, warm environment. I know in Canada, I've learned the winters are quite cold. You may not want to be having your kids riding in the middle of winter at minus 20 or something or whatever it is and six feet of snow but therefore a mechanical horse especially the ones these days where you have the video screens are just as valuable um, and obviously a therapy room helps with the therapist and these are my KPIs we know safety is import important but the logical progression from safety is not a risk but it's a thrill, it's a dare, it's being out of their comfort zone. So doing something a bit scary whilst being safe. And we're, and we're also having to deal with parents. You know, we've got to remember at this stage, we are handing, uh, parents are handing their children over with a disability, or in the case we had two weeks ago, an adult who's got an acquired disability was handed over by a husband to some crazy English person like me. We've got to show that we have due diligence in safety in the environment, and we are, we are running the environment professionally. Can't get anywhere without confidence. Does skill bring confidence, or does confidence bring skill? I still think it's something we should be introducing at this stage. Which end bites, which end kicks, which is the uncomfortable bit in the middle, and how to cope with that. We talked with fun in fundamentals, we talked about fun appropriate fun. I'm still not convinced I like to see adults on the lead rein playing games unless they want to, but that's me. And obviously the reason why trust is up there is for the very simple reason kids are being handed over to strangers, put on a fairly dangerous hairy animal. We've got to get that trust going. And at this point I use the word posture not position because of the therapy. You'll see a lot of this pony too. This is Forrester. Forrester is now 25. I bought him as a five-year-old and trained him completely from scratch myself. Because I think that's the other thing with the coaching in the therapy sessions. We need to keep, keep on top of the training of our horses. 
if you work with disabled athletes, has anybody ever sat on a horse after the rider with a disability has ridden them? Because very often the horse's muscular proprioception, the horse can't cope. The muscles are everywhere, especially with someone who's, who's athetoid or ataxic. The horses have to refine their own balance, and I think it's very, very important that we are actually keeping the horses programmed. So this little clip of video is same pony as the last time. This lad at the time was 13. Quadriple young man with quadriplegic CP, he is not weight bearing. And this is an exercise that I use quite a lot. And this is really to show you A, how he rides. You'll notice how he doesn't have stirrups. He's only fallen off a couple of times. Um, and the quality of the pony's paces. The pony is a little bit cheeky with its head. But you see that he's doing the basic skills of learning to ride. Stopping, starting. Because I'm primarily a competition coach, I'm interested in any dressage test that you'll ever do, you start and finish with the centre line. Always. So therefore, let's take centre lines early. Let's teach straightness in the horse early. So you can see there that he's riding without stirrups. I prefer him not to kick. He's better off sat still. The pony is well activated off the voice. And the pony doesn't have the biggest movement in the world. In fact, you'd probably say that was only jogging. But look how he sat. You wouldn't know unless I told you he was disabled. Okay. My voice comes out of the de depths. But you'll also notice that he's pre-prepared for his exercise. So all I'm doing is reminding him about the exercise. So he's already been briefed on what the exercise is. He uses his voice. In para, we can use our voice. Uses his corners properly. And you'll notice that he's in a 40 by 20 meter arena. The correct dress size size. Athletes with spatial awareness problems, it's not really fair on them to actually ride in the wrong size arena. So he's learning about corners. Because I harrowed this arena every day, he could ride into his corners. How many of you go to an indoor school and you can't teach corners because there are no corners because the sand's already built up. Some smiling going on in the arena already. But how can you teach rectangles, corners and circles if the arena doesn't allow you to? So this is for me the learning to ride phase. The outcome. I've put up there teach to ride because this was when I was doing my long-term coaching development plan rather than long-term athlete development plan. So the outcome is to create an athlete or a rider, participant, with the basic skills and the knowledge to want to go on and learn more. So you see that young man is already thinking about left and right, he's riding his corners, he's doing his halts. We're setting him up for success at a later stage. Obviously here we have a, uh, the type of horse I tend to use is a riding school horse. Um, we tend to be coach led at this point, still supported by the therapist because as I said in my little story earlier, there are certain things that I don't know about an athlete with an athlete with a spinal problem. What about pressure sores? What about lack of feeling and circulation? We still need the physiotherapist involved to advise us on this disability specific thing we're teaching with. Probably at this stage, most, of, most athletes are, on the, uh, are still on the lead rein. Obviously Jamie's off the lead rein, because I tend to get them off the lead rein as soon as I can, because the ponies are very well trained. But there was still a physiotherapist in the corner. Uh, there was also a young lady called Sophie Christensen in the corner who mentors him as well. So it's that legacy of putting back at even a certain stage. So, as I say, I'm passionate about, if you do the basics now, you don't need to revisit them later. And for me, you would never stand on stage and deliver a Shakespearean soliloquy 
without rehearsal. And rehearsal for me includes wearing the same kit that you compete in. We are an odd sport. We dress up more for competition than we do for training. And yet how often, I don't like wearing a shirt and tie. Most boys and men don't. And yet we don't put a shirt and tie on them until they're in the arena. Why don't we train with that? Those are the sort of things that we start introducing now. Where's the invisible letter X? Where is D? What does a five meter circle, look, five meter loop look like? What does a 10 meter circle look like? Because then as we talked earlier with long-term athlete development, not everyone is going to be a Paralympian or an Olympian, but everybody needs to know letters. Everybody needs to know the difference between a circle a corner and a straight line. We introduce these very early on so that by the time they come to competition they know exactly what a centre line is, where X is. I only had one athlete who went to his first competition. You saw from my arena, uh, the arena I worked in in England, it's 40 by 20. So the ponies tend to hug the wall, drop the outside shoulder and hug the wall. Now, I did have one athlete who qualified for his first national championships and said, do I have to go within those white boards? Which was a learning and a reflexive piece for me that went, hmm, maybe we should do arenas in different places. Well, that comes on a little bit later. Same pony, slightly tidied up. So the teacher train. We talked about competition appropriate. Well, for me, going to your first competition is not about winning. It's actually about platting, oh sorry, braiding the horse. I had one child who went down his first centre line, halted and started unpicking my braids. When I said to him why, he said because you've always taught me to brush the, brush the knots out of the neck. He thought the braids were knots. My fault for not, set, not setting that up. So this young man again was one of my athletes, again, no stirrups. I um, think at this point, where we talk about classification along with the LTAD stuff, no, I'm not suggesting I take my first grade one rider who is walk only to their first international within eight months. But they are going to improve. I'm probably going to get a walk rider to their first international quicker than I'll get a grade five, which is our least disability. And that again, I think, is where the age appropriate, uh, experience appropriate thing needs, we need to be very careful at. So this is his first national championship. You can sort of see how focused he is. You notice how quiet the pony is, and okay, I know it's a photograph, but the contact is good. So the pony is actually trained. I competed this pony when I was a lot slimmer. A um, little bit of video here in the teach to train bit. This is Sophie Christensen on one of her advanced horses. The other horse that comes past in a minute is her young horse. Notice that both these horses are Paralympic champions. But again, she's rehearsing her centre lines. Perfect planning prevents poor performance. And for me at this stage, although her position, is, uh, her position and posture is very important, she sat straight, but she's looking to feel the movement. And I think what's important here is how educated this horse is. He was a Grand Prix horse. And he wanted a, a, a slightly quieter life when he was a bit older. So he came to para. At this stage, I mean, although he is was completely drug free. At this stage where they're not competing, they can have a little bit of help with the drugs if necessary to make sure they're comfortable. But you'll notice that her, her groom is cantering around. Now, a lot of people go, that's not safe. But that's what a warm up is. We're better off educating the warm up now where she's got to cope with a distraction and we can manage the risk than she is going to her first competition and having horses cantering around the outside. Especially here with a gold show where you don't actually very often have your own warm up. So it's as well to have that um, developed early. 
So the teacher train phase, we're developing the knowledge. Athletes are educated at this point. As you saw on the video, is safe and ready to take on the challenges of, of competition effectively. One of the expressions we have in England, which I really don't like, is, oh, we're ready to go to a party. It's not a party. Yes, of course, it must be fun. Looking at Anne before she tells me off. But I personally believe, as a competition coach, you have fun through learning. Not learning through fun. But that's, that's me and that's, I'm a competition coach. But I think it's that, what is effective at this point? What are the goals we're trying to set? And again, I've put in here, we're starting to look at bronze and silver level shows. We discussed earlier about the video competitions, and I'm very proud of, of Jamie Ann's efforts with the video competitions. We've now got as far as going to, we've discovered it's cheaper to send the videos to international judges than it is sending horses to international judges. So we're now using international judges in the video competitions. And because the, a lot of these international judges are friends of mine, they not only give the feed, official feedback, but they'll then send me a written report afterwards about what I can change as a coach, which maybe we wouldn't want to change. Coaching's got to be effective. You can only change one thing at a time. So I'm all about what's the one thing that'll make a difference. So we're now starting to go on, rather than the basic coach, we're looking at the dressage coaches. Um, think at this point, if you're used to only having one coach with a certain set of language skills, it's a good idea to bring other coaches in at this point. Kids with learning challenges, very often changing the accent, or in my case, because I teach in Hong Kong and places like that, changing the language can be quite entertaining. So then you've got to make sure your coaching is effective by not saying too much. What's the one thing that's going to make a difference? So I think visiting clinicians at this point, they start to give you the idea about the athletes that are ready to move on, are ready to think for themselves. At this point, I think we go from regional advice, competition and training to start, this is when I tend to get involved. When you've got an athlete that you start thinking is probably international material, this is when I start to come in and give my, uh, my advice. However, now as well, we have athlete input. You couldn't hear on that particular video, but you've actually got Sophie talking rather than me doing the talking. Coaches need to know when to be quiet sometimes. They need to give the athletes the independence. It's one of the things we were talking about, about participation-centered. It's giving the athletes what they need. So I've put in here, this is where we start to bring in strength and conditioning coaches because now the therapy could be different. It isn't just about range of movement, it's about strength. We stop talking about, we stop talking about position and start talking about core stability. What do you need? One of my expressions is what do we need to make the boat go faster? What's the one thing that'll make a difference? Maybe, over here apparently you have to call them mental performance coaches. Not sure I understand why, because to me they're sports psychologists, and I do understand why it's to do with licensing and, 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 and legalese. But we bring in the sports psychology. How do you channel nerves? So we now start riding in different places, different arenas. What do different surfaces feel like underfoot? If you're used to riding in a nice soft surface, suddenly to have a harder jumping surface like they have in Europe, you feel a difference in the horse's stride. Well, the one thing about the walk, about walk dressage is the stride is the most important thing. And if you're suddenly chasing the horse for a stride that it can't have, you start losing marks, not gaining marks. So riding on grass, having the confidence in bigger open arenas. White boards inside dressage arenas. So often when we're riding in round pens or in the rectangular arenas, the horses, we don't actually notice it, but the horses are leaning on the wall the whole time. So we, we've lost the straightness and the symmetry of the horses. So then you stick tiny little whiteboards inside the arenas, sometimes that were, by broken I mean with gaps in them, and then wonder why the ponies are hopping out, going back to the wall. Especially if the athlete can't actually see where the arena is because they've got visual impairments problems. Um, obviously, at this point, we're looking at balance and suppleness. 
for me as well, it's about educating, encouraging the athlete to be more knowledgeable about themselves, their own physical fitness, and their knowledge of the horses, their feel, if you like, their effectiveness on a horse. I sometimes think we're so busy, you know, very often coaches see and never feel, but athletes feel and never see. I'm left-handed. I'll have no idea what it's like to be right-handed. That still feels uncomfortable to me. And if that's the case for me, who's someone who's, who's able-bodied, what you're feeling and what, you're, what the judges see can be different. But who gives the marks, the feelers or the seers? I mean, if the feelers come out of the arena and said, wow, that felt fantastic, they then blame the judge when they only get 48%. But it may be that it felt fantastic because it was the best feeling of what they always felt. Whereas sometimes when they come out of the arena and say, well, that, that felt awful, and their marks go up 15%. Very often a reason for that, you've done something different. So it will feel different. It may be what the judges want. So bringing in all those sort of challenges with the video analysis, the uh, analyzing dressage tests, why did you get a six for that? I have a theory that says when a judge says something, you make a mental note of it. When three different judges say the same thing on three separate occasions, you've probably got to change something. But if three different people are noticing it, under competition, you've then got to change it. But if one judge has said something, you've got to make a note of it, but you might just go, well, that's what their perception is. And I think understanding at this point, understanding perception of the different people is also very important. Following Facebook, because we've got an international going on in France at the moment, even some of our top athletes and coaches are blaming the judges. And yet, if you sit with a judge, you'll see that judges see different things from different parts of the arena. So actually, if they're all giving exactly the same marks, there may well be a problem with the judging, unlike when you think there is. Because if they're all just giving the same marks, you know, you will see straightness differently from different places. The horse of the Europeans last year had three tens on the short side. So e uh, from H, X, C, X and M, tens. But from the side, 5.5 .5 and 6. Do you blame the judges? Or do you analyse your test and realise that although the halt was square, the horse was not at X and it was still slightly crooked. But only the judges at E and B could see that. This is what I mean about preparation. That is the riding for disabled national dressage championships. To give Canada hope, 20 years ago, our national championships were held in one hour at the end of the Pony Club championships. Last year, we had 900 participants over three days, starting at nine o'clock in the morning and finishing at seven o'clock at night. At night. And we did jumping, and we did dressage, and we did musical rides, and we did walk in the countryside where you ride around a, a pond and there's a pig in a crate and stuff like that. But 900 athletes in one weekend. It's the largest disability sport, annual disability sport event in the world. But you've got to get used to riding in open spaces without a coach wittering in your ear the whole time. And this is a great picture because, again, Johnny, this rider, is riding without stirrups. In the next arena, there is a lady calling a test. Not his test. How do you get him to make sure he's focused on his test, not the lady next door? And it isn't just by Clive shouting louder, which is what you hear when you have three of them in a line. Um, it, it, educating him, Johnny, to know the test, to rehearse, cope, cope in that open space, being able to switch off so that he's not going, where's Granny? It's Granny come to watch. So now the trained to compete phase. 
This horse is a schoolmaster. He was again in a Grand Prix horse. This was taken in 2003 in Belgium. Not, many of an, not much of an audience, I have to say. So this goes back to Jamie, the lad we were watching earlier. He's now on a schoolmaster. This is the first time he sat on the horse. Now what you get in a minute, he's talking, not me. He's discussing what he's feeling. So part of that athlete empowerment, it's the first time he sat on this horse. It doesn't matter at the moment what he says, but he's working it out for himself. So instead of telling him what to do, I asked him a question. So he has to multitask. He's beginning to understand that the pony he rode, Forrester, has got a good rhythm but a quick tempo. Mambrusco has got a slower tempo. But there's now a conversation going on. All right, that'll do. Don't need to hear my own voice twice. But, but my point is that he's working it out. Instead of telling him, I'm asking him. So I'm going from being an instructor to coaching him and empowering him to think for himself. So um, incidentally, the grey horse, um, that's Lambrusco. He won two Paralympic gold medals, two World Championship gold medals, and three European Championship gold medals. He was also a Grand Prix horse. And also, if you look at his own competition record, at five years old, he was getting 48%, 52%. He's by a Dutch stallion called Uniform, who the Dutch wouldn't use and sold him to the United States very quickly because the horse had a temperament problem. Lambrusco had a temperament problem until he was 12 years old. Suddenly he grew up. But the point is that when he was ready, he became a para horse. Now that horse is 23 years of age. He's taken 10 different athletes to international competition level, including one side saddle. And he's still in a therapy program to this day, fit and healthy doing his job. But that's the point of giving somebody, you don't teach someone to drive in a Formula One racing car, but you don't expect them to win in an SUV. And when they're 17 or 18 years of age, you don't expect them to be programming or tuning up their own car. They need, and, and riding is the same. Different horses for different courses. And I think as we talked about earlier in the presentation, you don't teach a child to, to read with Shakespeare. You start off with the cat sat on the mat. And then you put 26 letters together and some of us only get as far as the cat sat on the mat. And some of us get a little bit further. Horses, I think, are the same. So this train to compete phase, we're looking to, I'm expecting athletes, because I'm a team coach, not a personal coach, which again, that role changes. A personal coach can say, yeah, well, as long as you remember one thing, whereas I'm going, no, I need you to win. I want schools and having kittens again. But it's, as John was saying this morning, it's about, at some point, you do have to win. Because if you don't win, you can't lose. And how do you lose on one day and get a medal on the second day? How do you cope with failures? What does failure look like? So we had a situation in 2004 where, where Sophie went down the centre line at her first ever Paralympic Games and came last. Sophie doesn't do losing. She throws things at you. And she cries. And when Sophie cries because of her cerebral palsy, her arms go everywhere. And she leaks tears and the makeup runs. And then she throws something at you. I had to learn how I had to learn to dodge very fast. But the following day, through a mental performance coach, she went from 25th to a bronze medal. 
Now, you can't tell me that talent failed her on the first day and miraculously came back on the second day. Because that just doesn't happen. But what did we do to turn it around within 24 hours and 20% difference? What did we do? And actually all we did, we sat there for four hours until Sophie named three things she did well. And by naming the three things she did well, she realised she wasn't as bad as she thought she'd been. She hadn't let anybody down because she'd done three components well. And the following day went up 22 places. And that to me is a very powerful story about why psych psychology, mental performance is so, so important. Talked earlier about performance on demand. So, anybody an event rider here or a jumper? Okay, what are you going to do if you stand at the start line and the coach says to you, be very careful of fence number six, the last 14 people have all fallen off at fence number six? I didn't hear that, John, I probably don't want to. <laughs> but as coaches, our language is so important. You look beautiful tonight, but... You cooked a wonderful meal, but. Whereas you, looked, you cooked a beautiful meal tonight and to make it better. One's negative, one's positive. What would you rather have your coach say as you go through the start line? Don't fall off or ride safely. And don't for me is such a wonderful word. And for all of you, don't think of a red bus. Don't think of a red bus. Don't think of a red bus. And what are you all thinking about? Because the last thing I said was red bus. And as coaches, it's so important to get that language right, especially under pressure. And we don't need to be, we don't need to be disappointed when we come out the area for our athletes. They'll be disappointed. Nobody tries to ride badly. And, you know, and also be very careful how you cope with your athlete. Who's ever looked after a grey horse? They're horrible things to look after. I've had several of them. And the worst thing for me when I was a young developing instructor stroke coach was my athlete coming out the arena going, well, that went badly. And I'm thinking, I spent eight hours, four o'clock this morning, bathing it, platting it, training it, even cleaning tack, which I don't like doing. And all you can do is say you come out the arena and do, did badly. So we developed a strategy, because this is what, even at this stage, it's about. It's about learning and developing strategies about how you cope under pressure. What happens if they don't have your favourite, better say something healthy, what happens if they don't have your favourite apples in the hotel and you need your favourite apples? So for me, when Sophie came out the arena, all I ever did was patted the horse, gave her a hug and said, thank you very much, I'll see you at the scoreboard. Only when the tangible evidence was on the scoreboard did we discuss it. Because then we could say, yes, you rode like a bag of spanners. But until we had the score, there was no point because it was all about perception. And yes, perception is reality, but actually it's not when someone else's perception is giving you, giving you the medals. So we're also looking at this point, you know, knowledge, balance and suppleness, effectiveness, obviously influence over a horse, transferability on riding different horses, I think it's all, and, and different environments. In Hong Kong at the Paralympic Games, we didn't ride till 11 o'clock at night. What are you going to do all day, twiddling your thumbs, waiting for your test time? Do you crack up under pressure? And I can still tell you that it was from the warm-up arena in Hong Kong to the competition arena was 2 minutes 37 seconds. Half a dressage test. And why was that so important? Not because I'm a little bit anal about things like that, although I am. Um, but the, the thing that was important was it was something like 42 degrees and 90% humidity. That's sticky. And if your body doesn't function well under heat, you're at the Paralympic Games. The 
taxpayers have paid you to be there with lottery funding and you just say it was a little bit hot, you're not going to be popular if you lose a medal because you're a little bit hot. That's the point about wearing a jacket. I was not popular with anybody at home. I spent six months driving everywhere in my car with the windows up and my thermals on and the heating on full blast. Nobody would come in the car with me. But it was my way of saying, I'm not going to let my athlete down. I'm going to, cope in the, going to cope in the heat. The other thing we did that was very important was, Sophie did, was very inclined to say things such as, well, I get tired. We banned that because all she had to do was come out of the air conditioning for five minutes a day, whereas I was looking after horses. And if I've got an athlete saying she's tired or she's hot and she's sticky and she's stood there in her bathing costume after being at the swimming pool all day long, whereas I've been with the horses, we were going to have clash. And it's that developing effective strategies so that by the time you get to the competition, the end goal, you know how to deal with each other. So this is the grey horse. You saw him with Jamie on, this is five minutes later. He was 20 at this point. Beginning to show you actually why he was a world, is a world-class horse. As I say, no stirrups. Whether this therapy, or whether this is therapy, or whether this is sport, because she's about to go sideways. She's being effective. Okay, position went a bit wonky. A little bit of a loss of the break in the pace, but then the horse comes around the corner and she's got him round again. And you can see that Sophie that's made the horse round and educated. You'll notice there are no photographs on this presentation of, of any of my horses going hollow. They all go to the bit. They all work in a contact. They all follow the scales of training, even in the free walk, which as Sophie says is a horrible exercise. She now goes to the gym three times a week specifically to work on her core stability when leaning forwards. Because that, ex that movement has a coefficient of two in the test. Over five judges, that's 100 marks. To not want to lean forward and not gain those marks could cost you a medal. This is a, I've got the next couple of slides are just my ponies really. It gives you an idea of the different horses you can take to an international. They don't have to be world class to start off with the training. The Palomino pony at the top is 13 hands, two inches high, and it's Welsh. And it behaves like a Welsh pony. It's not a nice pony, and in its spare time it drives. So it's a bit of a hooligan. But it's still got 63% in an international. The coloured horse below Princess is, in England, we'd call it a heavyweight show cob. Not the best paces in the world, although that picture doesn't show that. He's been to Wembley under the lights and with an audience, so I know he's safe. And he's built on the bit. The grey horse at the bottom, interesting horse. Raced 14 times. Then point pointed. Then he became an event horse. Very good event horse, went to intermediates in England. Uh, then he did side saddle and hunted. Now he's doing international para. And then the little bay pony is a, 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 an ordinary, if you like, New Forest pony. And then next to the New Forest pony is Forrester. The young lady on him is Natasha Baker. She's now current World European and Paralympic. Well, no, she's not current, but she's been European World and Paralympic champion. She started off on one of my hairy ponies. That's her first ever cup. The horse next to that is Pure Red Shire. Yes, the rider is a little small for him. Quite happy to admit that. But you can see his way of going means there's absolutely no reason why she can't ride him in an arena. And then the horse at the top is a hairy Vanna, coloured gypsy cob. That was fourth at the Paralympic Games in London. And it is just a hairy cob. 
well trained. Everything is about not necessarily winning, what does good look like? And my coaching philosophy says, good looks like being the best you can be with the talents that you have on any given day. And that little, you know, and that, the, the bay horse, the, the, the coloured cob with the side saddle, 68% of the European Championships, 68% of the World Championships, 67% of the Paralympic Games. You're going to take that on a team if you know you want those sort of scores. I don't, I want 70%. Again, just different views of the horses we're using and have used. They're not therapy horses, but that's how they start. Stinner on the bottom right hand side has no legs from the seat down. If you do anything after this uh, presentation, Google search Stinner and watch her ride on video. She was born without legs and she's not strapped in. The only problem she has is the canter work because she tends to fall off because of the centrifugal force. But again, four different horses, one, one young man riding one handed no stirrups. Erin's missing both her legs and got short arms. He, he was a Grand Prix horse. These are seriously trained horses. And then we have this one. You will all have ponies like this in your therapy yards. It is a field. And it's, that was at a World Equestrian Games. And I have got a video. I'm not going to bore you with my videos as well as my holiday snaps. But I've got a video, 68% of the European Championships this pony got. You only want four of those in a team to be within the top five. So you've all got fields in the therapy barns. You've all got horrible little ponies in your fields. If they're trained correctly, they can do a para job. And that's just a clip of probably more of an acceptable dressage horse with a young man and his adapted tack and no arms. And then finally, the phase is obviously coaching or training or riding or whatever to win. There's only one thing that's important about at this point. Your goal is set at the outset. To win medals. To be the best you can be, which is the best in the world. Again, three more horses. Um, Spanish horse at the top, probably the number one ranked Canadian horse in para at the moment. It's done three internationals, the lowest it's come, with, it was the third in his first one. Won two classes in Wellington this year. Very ordinary horse, getting 72% at international level. The judge came out of the arena and says, when he learns to walk, he will be a good horse. And he's still getting 72% because of the accuracy, which starts off in the earlier phases. She's done the accuracy, she's done the harmony, she's done the square halts. Very ordinary horses. Obviously the one underneath is just in there. Again, big warm blood, showing you stinner without any legs. But the horse on the right, that's Teddy. Teddy cost his owner 800 pounds which is 12, 1300 bucks. And he's still at the Paralympic Games. And he was age 17. The horse that came third in um, Hong Kong was 23 years old and was a pony club pony. But the point about Teddy is when Anne rode the better test, she beat the best horse in the world was the grey horse Lambrusco. But Sophie had to ride a good test in order to beat Teddy. When this horse performed better, he was awarded better marks. And what I'm really wanting to get across to you is you don't need your multi-million dollar horses. Yes, they help because your work's done for you. But actually, the hard work is so much more um, when you put the hard work in with an ordinary horse and train it well, uh, the satisfaction is so much better. And these are the more usual horses you'll see. Janeiro 6 at the top. Again, as I say, a Grand Prix horse. That was in London 2012 where he won three medals. 
and you can sort of see how Sophie's position has developed since she was riding Rivaldo Barkley at WEG in 2010. But again, all the horses are true to the contact, they're correctly trained, they're rhythmical and straight and in balance. And the only reason I put the coloured horse in at the bottom, painted a fair, is because that's a para rider. She was the first para rider in the world to compete at Prix Saint-Georges. Obviously able-bodied. And that's the point. We're using it as stepping stones to do whatever the athlete wants. So I've just put this little bit of clip, it, clip in at the end to show you what a world-class walk actually looks like. Not the sort of horse you're going to have in your therapy centres. And you'll see from the video actually how much movement Sophie actually has and how she has to cope with it. But the overtrack is massive. This is the best horse in the world. And you can see that although she has a lot of peculiar movements, she's actually still rhythmical. And she's not, apart from this bit, this bit where the horse falls over in the halt. The lordosis in her spine is not affecting the horse at all. So the compete to win phase. To, and some of this I changed today. This empower an athlete to win at international level. That's what we're looking for. Or is on the podium want performance on demand? It was mentioned earlier in the LTAD. So the whole point about performance on demand is you are able to ride anywhere and cope with any environment. So you don't the horses and you don't mind flying. There's no point getting to it, aiming for an international and then discover your athlete doesn't want to fly, or they don't want to eat anything but mum's home cooked food or they can't compete without their lucky socks, or whatever it happens to be. And at this point, it's fairly straightforward. It's always about athlete-driven. Riders are independent, thinking for themselves. The team is whoever the athlete want. There was a situation with the British Cycling. The British cyclists had a rule that said, no you couldn't have an affair with one of your coaches. You couldn't be a partner with one of your coaches. One of the British cyclists was having an affair with her coach. And when British Cycling found out, they removed the coach from the programme. The athlete's performance went downhill dramatically and sustained dramatically. British Cycling changed their mind. And I think that's you know, the point is that you build, the athlete has now built their own support system. And we, as a team, we have to cope with it. And I think that's what it takes to win. I think it's about the harmony and the partnership, especially with disability sport. For me, at this point, it's all about rehearsal. The judges give out the marks, so let's find out what they want. It's all about test riding. It's all about, as I said earlier, strength and conditioning. It's about being able to prepare yourself properly, to be able to cope with distractions. What do you do if your a family member is sadly got terminal cancer and you're competing in international? Do you want to be told about it? Or do you on who do you want to tell you? should your parent have died? And these are actual questions that we've actually had to deal with. But we don't have them at the competition. We don't have somebody rushing up, just you've got on a horse saying, oh, by the way, the guinea pigs died at home. It's, we prepare it in advance. So most athletes at an international will stay off Facebook, will stay off Twitter. And in fact, what we very often do is give athletes their own phones. So they, and they, 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 most of them tend to switch their phones off. But what do you do if you need your own favourite water? Which some, which we had an athlete who did need her own particular brand of water. 
Clive Woodward with the English rugby team at one of the competitions running up to the World Championships. Um, they went down with food poisoning. So what did he do to eliminate that? He took his own chef to a competition. And the hotels that wouldn't allow him to have his own chef, the, the, the English team didn't use them. It's that perfect planning prevents poor performance the whole time. How are you going to win? How are you going to get to the start line? How are you going to get to the end of your performance? Knowing that you've delivered the best you possibly could. could. How can you perform on demand with a consistent score? How do you cope with nerves? We have athletes on the British team in the past who have to be at the show venue all day because they have to absorb the atmosphere. We have uh, other athletes who lock themselves in the room. There's no right or wrong. It's about how do you as an athlete cope with your nerves? when probably alcohol isn't really the best way of coping. But that's your X factor. That's what makes a world-class athlete. And that's the end result. Three different horses, world, European, Paralympic champions. All at walk. You, can you imagine keeping a fit competition horse concentrating for about eight minutes in a test without having trot work or counter work to keep it fresh and active and energetic in front of the leg with three halts. But that's what a world-class horse looks like. So is that one, well the brown one anyway. Any questions? Because that's lasted, I think that, what, that's lasted about an hour? Nobody's quite snoring yet and falling asleep. But does anybody have any questions on that? But the point is, as we talked about earlier, excellence, I think we all have to ask ourselves the questions. What does excellence look like? And it might be riding your first flying change. It might be your first shoulder in. It might be coming off the lead rein. But at the end of the day, we all need these goals. Whether it's to win, whether it's to come off the lead rein, whether it's to ride at your first competition, or whether it's to stay on. But as coaches and athletes, we have to be asking ourselves the question, what does good look like and feel like to me? Because only, only then when you have your goal, can you really create a plan to perfect it. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, you are still awake. And I think that's about it. But see, if anybody's got any questions privately or wants to come and see some videos of what we're doing with the, with the field ponies, you're more than welcome to come and talk to me privately. Thank you. I've got, uh, I've got two questions for you. First is, at what point um, in your long experience with Sophie did you feel that there was something that might indicate that she would make it all the way up to stage five? The first time I met her. She had something, she had that X factor. She was an angry, difficult, stroppy, frustrated 13-year-old. But she had something about her that said, I'm not going to let quadriplegic cerebral palsy get in my way. And so when she learned to drive a car, she passed a test the first time. When we did the selection trials, when we did the, um, the, the final selection trial for the first Paralympics when she was 16, she was also supposed to sit in her exams for her, what were then O-levels in England. Her parents, being academics, wanted her to focus on her education. Sophie wanted to focus on, her, on, on getting to the Paralympic Games. So what we did was we spoke to the school and we flew the exam papers to Belgium, where the, exam, where the competition was taking place. We spoke to the show organisers and we arranged for Sophie's competition to be in the afternoon so she could sit her exam in the morning with all her classmates at school. 
And that's the bit about teamwork, because we had to persuade her parents, who are both school teachers, to let her do that. We had to persuade the school to do that. We had to persuade the, the, the show organisers, which wasn't a problem, to do that. But it was that team supported at 16. But it was the fact she could organise herself, even with her severe amount of disability, she could organise herself, she knew what she wanted, and she had that from the word go. I don't want to be on the lead rein. I want to be the best I can be. And, and that's, so therefore just teaching the technical skills was the easy bit. Okay, she's you know, very intelligent. But the first time I saw her, I thought, yeah, you've got, you've got that X factor, which is hence the whole thing about Simon Cowell, because you start to see, and no, of course you don't ever write a rider off if you don't see it the first time, but she did. She couldn't, well, there's a different psychology discussion here, but she couldn't bear to lose. Hated not achieving. And it was personal achievement as well as, as, well as success. Um, and we, we, we learnt a lot about the difference between success and achievement. But yeah, but to answer your question, the first time I saw her. So my, my second question is a little, a little quicker. Um, and if you'll excuse me, it's probably being the only non-question question. Why was there a pig in the crate? <laughs> Good question. It's, it's, it's a competition. It's a competition called Walk in the Countryside. And the whole idea is for kids uh, and uh, young people with the learning disabilities who aren't going to understand dressage, but they still get the same physical therapy. So they may not understand what a circle is, but a pig in a crate, they've got to go round it. And so they're learning to do circles in a different way. Well, it's a good question, though. And of course, they don't like the smell of pigs either. <laughs> But it's also it's a way of testing the pony's training too. If the pony will go with, the, you know, whether you walk a 10 metre circle in a 40 by 20 metre dressage arena, or whether you do it around a pig in a crate or a duck on a pond. Because at the end of the day, if you're riding out, stopping and starting is important. It's more important riding out. So, it, just teaching equestrian skills. Yes? Do you see, or like what discipline do you see more athlete retention in with para? Within uh, which sport do we see more attention in? It's very similar figures to able-bodied. Very often they get they get to a point when we talk about para sport rather than para participation. If you the young ones when they start in therapy centres, they the ones that are have the intellectual ability to understand what dressage is. This thing this thing called school gets in the way. And so you, say, you see the same drop off. And we know that for, for very often horses come between, now this is going to sound very sexist, but we know very often horses sound, come between, they, they separate toys and boys. And the minute when you're starting to have to train three or four times a week is the time where very often boys come in. Or girls if you're a male sort of thing. And we're too sexist here. And... You know, and I think they have to make decisions. Um, but what, I, what I'll say is that there are 26,000 riding athletes, para, uh, disabled riders in the UK, 26,000 of us, of them, of which 300 are registered with the sport, with British Dressage for the sport, of which on our squads we have 12 athletes of which we can only take four to a Paralympic Games. So that gives you an idea of participation through to international. But it, it's very similar. And, and the ones that aren't going to school tend to ride longer, but they don't tend to stay in the sport. It's more recreation and participation. But hopefully I've shown you a little bit today that virtually any horse correctly trained can do a para dressage test. As long as the horse is fit for purpose, as long as it's sound and healthy and safe, it can compete. And like we were talking about earlier with LTAD, it can start off in your own venues within the video competitions. And when you're getting good scores at the video competitions, the progression is then bronze show. And then when you're doing good scores at bronze show, you go up the next level to the goal show. And then when you're getting good at goal shows, that's when you ring me. Because that's when we start to go to the next level. Can I just make a comment about the earlier phases? Um, so, um, a 
severely disabled rider is not likely to go straight to a high class coach and say, I want to be a top class rider. They're likely to come to a therapeutic riding centre and, like you said, and start off in the therapy situation. But then, and that's where I work, in the therapeutic riding. And then you bring your rider on, and what we find is lacking is that bridge from therapeutic riding into the higher stages that you were talking about. Um, either because people feel they don't have the right horses, um, which often is not true. They do have the right horses, they just need to identify them. Um, and so I feel there's a, to help bring riders up to that international level, there needs to be a bit of a bridge made between that therapeutic riding level and the more competitive level. Because there's no way as a therapeutic riding instructor I can take my mind all the way. We have to be brave enough, and that's that point about visiting clinicians. We have to be brave. You don't have the same school teacher at 18 that you had as a four year old at preschool or two years old at preschool. You change teachers regularly, and that's accepted in education. And yet, somehow, because there's a business involved of earning money, coaches don't want to necessarily hand their athletes over or they want to sell them a horse and in the earlier stages they very often are frustrated because there's nowhere to go and, and you're right one of the key stages of, of identifying an athlete is being when do they come off the lead rein and they come off the lead rein when it's safe for them to do so and whether that's safe because they can learn left and right and take, a, take instruction or whether it's safe because the pony you know will follow will just come straight down the arena to you um, but it's it's giving it's empowering coaches to have that to be brave to take them off the lead rein and to say you know what I'm beginning I, I have an expression which I use a lot is when the rider is costing my horse marks train or change the rider when the horse is costing the rider marks train or change the horse maybe we should add to that when the coach is costing the rider marks. Train or change the coach. But we have got to be brave with that. I think also the higher level coaches need to be brave enough totally. to take on the riders that we say are doing well and maybe the higher level coaches need to be brave enough to take on that challenge as well. Which ties into the LTAD stuff. There's, there's a word here, and I can't remember the quote, it's a Kipling quote, but one of the most important words in the English language, and one of the most important words in goal setting, is how. And I think what coaches like myself have to do is give other coaches the knowledge of how to take you off the lead rein, how to ensure the horse is safe, how to ensure that the rider is safe. And no, you don't take them off for the first time in the middle of a 30 acre field. You know, you take them off in a 40 by 20 metre arena in a straight line. Oh, they've managed the straight line three times. Now they can go around one corner. Oh, now they've gone around the one corner three times and not fallen off. We can do two corners. And suddenly you do two straight sides and two corners. And then suddenly you do four straight sides, two long ones, two short ones with four corners in them, and you're off the lead rein. It's the progressive, it's the, another expression I like is tiny, attainable, tickable targets. It's process goals the whole time. So you're upwardly trending and upwardly developing the marks. So you, t you don't, you know, Sophie Christensen is getting 80% at international level. You don't expect an athlete to start off without their first video competition. But you also don't say, yeah, you only got 55%. You turn your 5.5s into 6s. Turning your 5.5 into 8 is probably not doable. But turning your 5.5 into 6s is, is doable. Once you ask the question, how do I do that? And that's why that thing I had at the end, asking questions. As coaches, we talk too much. And we don't talk about the right things. We should be asking questions. I've said it several times. What does good look like? 
and only then when you create your plan. And that's, I think, the goal setting piece and the motivational piece is really quite important. But I'm very happy to show any, any coach how to take their athletes off the lead rein if it's safe to do so. And then leave the chaos behind with the therapy centres where they've got nobody on the lead reins anymore. <laughs> any other questions? So, okay, question for you all. Can you, is anybody brave enough to stand up and say they learnt three things today? Or even one thing. No, Chris, you can't have pigs in crates. <laughs> Anybody like to write down or stand up and say three words? Because I'm sure there are coaches in this room, and I'm sure they're not normally used to being quiet for, for an hour and a half. Three words that have, you've taken away from this and will put into your environment, or, or from the LTAD one earlier. Anybody brave enough? Chris, have you got, okay, Chris, have you got three words? Um, the... Uh... One thing, uh, I'm just looking at my takeaways here, so I can pick it great. Um, you don't teach someone to drive in a Formula 1 car. I see this across all of my sports. People too focused on equipment and not enough on skill. All the gear, no idea. Yeah. And then the, the other, in, in fact, for me, incredible takeaway was you maybe letting it slip a little bit and without even knowing that you did it. 26,000 participants turning into 300 athletes, which is 1%, mm -hmm. 1.1, turning into a handful of paralympics. And I think it's important for, especially at the convention, where we, we talk a lot about performance, and specifically when I'm around, people talk a lot about high performance, but it really is High performance leads the way in, in some things, but it is not the program. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be cognizant of that, in that high performance is an unobtainable goal for a lot of people, but that doesn't mean that the goals that they have um, are any less virtuous or good. Yeah, it's, uh, it's about the individual participant. And, and very interesting for me is having a situation recently, which I won't go into, how I had to react as a team coach, managing an overall team, compared with how I wanted to react as a personal coach. And you have to let you, that's something you, it's a conflict you have to deal with. And I think that's right, it's about everybody's individual goals. It's about empowering people to be the best, or facilitating. Yeah, anybody else? Yes? It's persuading therapy centres, once they've done the video competitions, which is a great start, why can't we then start looking at little competitions between two therapy centres? Because if your initial um, moving away from one therapy centre, which is ang anxious for the horses, for the coaches and, and everybody else, but if you know you're going to another therapy centre, you know which is counter approved and it's sort of maybe an hour down the road you start to see which people will put the effort in to do that because if they'll, if they'll put the effort in to go an hour down the road they'll probably go eventually when the money's there to go across on the ferry but if they're not prepared to go an hour down the road you know they're not a sport athlete and I think that's the one thing I would like to see now is that the individual therapy centres starting to put together their own little competitions which don't need to be judged by anybody high-powered. Any 
visiting clinician come and judge it on a rider mark because the scores aren't important. We discussed earlier, the scores are not the most important thing in the world. The Getting them down the centre line, getting them in a jacket, getting them learning about winning and losing and trying their best is what's important at that stage. So little local competitions, which is the next step from the video competition, doing it away from home. And the, the other thing is, as I've hopefully demonstrated, I'm one of the few people who can do both at both levels. I am very happy, and if you want to link it in with dressage or jumping or pole work, I am very happy to travel anywhere and do the presentation like this or come and do a couple of days clinics. And I'm very happy if you give me some, some horrible little boys on the lead rein, perfect. And Fiona will vouch she see me coach on the lead rein as well as the high power stuff. And, and I think that's the way forward. And what we're looking to do, the long term plan, is we're writing a coaching syllabus at the moment, which the committee have now had its first look at, and we'll start rolling out to encourage coaches to be trained in para as well as therapy. And they can be para trained and not sit an exam and not have athletes at international level. So although the scores, you know, to be qualified, you get, you get your national scores, but actually to sit on these modules and just do 15 minutes on how do you come off the lead rein or what para sport is or whatever. And eventually what we'll do is then start having regional coaches. So you don't have to see my ugly face the whole time. I've put some effort in and you only bring me in when you need to. And that's how we'll roll it out. So that you've got, I mean, because when I'm not in Canada, I'm... As my accent says, I'm British. So when I'm not in Canada, I'm 3,000 miles away. But I do, I do a lot on Facebook and whatever. But I am more than happy to come out and get some. Any coaches that want to start, Jamie, Ann and I are here to get you started. Kendra will tell you how much we, we can put in to give you the support at the beginning, if you want to. Yeah, and I'm very happy to travel wherever over the summer. Any other questions? Any other words? Um, I just wanted to share that I thought it was really empowering watching the one clip of the gentleman. It sounded like you were talking the whole time coaching. Yeah. But to see the athlete actually doing some self-discovery and, and you were listening and, and empowering that athlete, I think that's really important for um, mm -hmm. that relationship. I think a lot of times the coach is talking, 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 and they don't necessarily get an opportunity to do that, so I no. thought that was really good to, to watch, uh, watch that particular situation. God gave us two ears, two eyes, and only one mouth for a reason. But with Jamie, he obviously is in the UK, and at the moment he's sitting his GCSEs. He lives two hours away from where he rides, because that's the best stables for him. On his journey home, on a Sunday morning, he will write his reflection and he will send it to me on Facebook. So every single week, by the, wherever I am in the world, by the time I turn Facebook on, there is, and some, day, some, some weeks it's only three words. Some weeks it's three sentences. And then some weeks it's when he's had a, when he's had a light bulb moment. And it has to be him, because I don't, because, okay, eventually they upload the video to YouTube. But my first contact with Jamie after his lesson is what he writes down. So I have to say to him, sorry Jamie, I didn't understand that. What does pop, you know, its head popped up, or its head popped out. What the hell does that mean? Oh yeah, sorry. And then he rewrites it. So, so we're developing, as we talked earlier with LTAD, we're developing a common language. And then I can start reading his reflections. 
and saying, I know what went on in that lesson. And, and because I work so often in foreign countries where English is the second language, I very often have to stand there. I will say something, which is where, where this thing about don't comes in. Because very often don't doesn't translate. So I can stand there and I can say something to my translator, and the translator does whatever the translator does, and I've got to go, did they understand? Because if they, understand, if they understood, I can see that in the writing improving. It's like turning the videos, turning the volume down. If it's clear and concise to a foreigner, then it's clear and concise to the horse. And these are the tools that I use when I'm working in languages that aren't my own or when I'm 4,000 miles from my athlete. If I can read it and go, yeah, that makes sense, or I can hand it to a, another coach who reads the same thing, it's clear. And there's a commonality there, which means that you've got that consistency in your coaching. So the, the stuff about LTAD, which I am obviously passionate about, and I'm very much into my sports science and sports coaching, but you listen when, when people like me stand up in the arena, stand up here and talk about these sort of things, so often you can see coaches going, well, we can't do that, we can't do that, it won't work. I bloody well tell you, it does. Because that 15 years, although I didn't know it was called LTAD, the proof is we started with a fundamental young lady at 13 and she's now a multi, multi winning medalist. And more importantly, she has the life skills to have a boyfriend, she has the life skills to have a job, and she now sits on government committees discussing disability rights. That's the power of what our sport actually is. The medals are meaningless unless we have the legacy to put them back into something else. And that's the, the only point of medals, is to generate more athletes, better training, better welfare, and in para, better understanding of disability. Anybody else brave enough to add words to what we've talked about? So we've got, so you might, uh, hopefully you've, Put your hand up if you haven't got anything from that. No one's going to be brave enough to do that, are they? Okay. <laughs> and if I ask you to put your hand up if you have, no one's going to say anything anyway, in case they're terrified they're going to pick on you. Can you all honestly say that if I asked you to put three words on Twitter or three words on Facebook about what you've got from this, you could all put three words down or at least one, one phrase or something? Because that's the legacy. You don't just haven't fallen asleep and in here. You can go away with something. And hopefully, in about what I would suggest you do is write three things down, because it is always more impactful if you write it down, and put the three words or three phrases in your pocket. And in six weeks' time, take them out of your pocket, look at those three words, and ask yourselves, am I now integrating that into my coaching? If you are, whether you've looked at the words or not, if you are, t this afternoon has been effective because you're thinking about it in six weeks' time. And it's always about that one thing that makes a difference. The most impact. And then it's, as I say, what makes the boat go faster. Okay, I'm still around for the rest of the day if you, want to, if you would like to discuss anything privately or you want me to bore you with videos of any of the athletes, horrible Norwegian Fiona Fjord ponies doing dressage. And that's the point. They can do it if they're trained. And it's that consistency. Anyway, I'll shut up. Thank you very much indeed.